Um, I feel that fashion is sometimes misperceived as just something that is on catwalks and something that is very glamorous all the time. Um, but people forget that fashion is actually something that everybody has to do with whether or not they want to or not because everybody gets up in the morning everybody gets dressed and one of the things that I found really fascinating when I did my research is that we also missed that we're actually covering the largest organ with fashion which is our skin but we don't really seem to care a lot about it and I feel that's when I really started to to kind of like look at it when I thought well we put something on ourselves, but we don't actually know that where it comes from. We don't know what it was treated with. Uh, we don't know how it was produced. And um, that that's kind of like re reflecting on it. I thought it was quite interesting that we actually know very little about what, what we do sometimes. And I felt that we actually really need to start caring a lot more, um, especially when you look and when you like look at the media and also like hear and and see what, what's actually happening with with the massive waste problem with companies burning stock with things just being discarded in landfills now we see a lot of um, countries that have a secondhand waste problem because things are just simply not produced to standard and you can't use it and it just ends up somewhere in a really picturesque landscape and it's just there and that's when I really thought, like, right, we, we need to do something about it and we need to start raising awareness. We, st we need to start making more campaigns. We need to like really understand what is the reason of our current behaviour and how can we actually change it. And you're, you come from this perspective somehow of uh, fashion marketing and management. So this perception aspect behind uh, uh, fashion sustainability and what how would you define fashion sustainability? What would be from your perspective and from your research point of view, a, a good definition of fashion sustainability? That's a really tough question <laughs> because I feel it's, uh, it's, so, it's so wide. Uh, normally when I, when I personally define it, I feel it's very much about making things last and making things from materials that ideally biodegrade and don't have an environmental impact, whilst at the same time are being produced with kind of like animal rights, human rights um, in mind, and be economically viable. So there's like the kind of like three angles of it. Uh, most of them could interlink, but it's obviously very hard for organizations to actually create something that is truly sustainable. Uh, one of the things is also because our benchmarks constantly move. So one time we say, well, organic cotton is the best thing. The next time around, you might say, well, actually material X is the best one and then so on. So, so the benchmark always changes. But for me, when I talk about sustainability, it's especially also like looking at the end of life and that a garment is not just wasted, but that this so-called waste product can actually be transformed into something else that's got a longer life for it. Mm -hmm. I think there's a couple of them. One of them is about the infrastructure. So when we think about, right, a garment doesn't fit anymore for whatever for whatever reason, but might still be in good condition, where does it end up? So either we sell it online, um, we could drop it off at a charity shop, or we could put it in a collection box. But afterwards, we, we almost don't really have any kind of like idea what happens to it. So some research says that, for example, charity shops are also similar to fast fashion, kind of like shops where they change their stock every two weeks if it's not sold it's just being shipped somewhere else so we make it somebody else's problem if we put something in a donation box for example with very good intention sometimes they get sold but sometimes and it depends what people put in those donation boxes those donation boxes might also not be usable anymore because they're so heavily contaminated that the only thing you could actually do with it is for example like burn it and well you would at least get energy out of it um, but it's not ideal because obviously it was something that was valuable before. And uh, that's only like when we think about, well, the, the garment might still be actually worthwhile wearing. If you've got something that we say, well, actually, it's got a tear or the quality was just not very good. 
there's not really any infrastructure at the moment where we can discard it and somebody would recycle it because we don't have enough recycling technique or it might be very expensive or it also has to be exported. So I think infrastructure is a, is a very big issue. Mm -hmm. There's also an issue of overproduction, overconsumption, and it's kind of like the chicken and egg question, like which, which one demands which, because obviously if you produce more, people are more likely to actually buy more. And it's also something where marketing probably has played a massive role, especially when you go on a high street, for example, and you look around every two weeks, like the, the windows are changing, you get new collections in, and we're almost like primed to look out for those new innovations or the new like kind of like garments, anything that, that is there. And we automatically want to go and we automatically want to see it. And then we spent more money. So it's kind of like this vicious circle. But that's a, a big issue because also, unfortunately, some of the, the garments that are being brought in on a two weekly basis are also not quite the quality anymore because it's just done very, very quickly. Um, and unfortunately, they also don't last that long. Some of them do, um, but some of them obviously don't. And I feel it's also an issue with um, policy and regulation. So I feel there's a lot of things that are being done and a lot of things that are being discussed within the fashion industry, which is fantastic to see. So there's definitely steps there. But if we look at a European level or a European Union level, including the UK, there's just so many countries involved that we don't actually know are they all doing exactly the same? Probably not, because we've got very different infrastructures. We've got very different cultures and very different background and heritage of, of how we actually deal with different things. And could it really be enforced across all of them? Or is it just guidelines? And then again, if you look at different policies, like, for example, the extended producer responsibility, which in itself is a great idea, because organizations should be responsible for the waste that they're producing, but it's also then understanding, like, what do consumers, for example, know of when they're bringing back the garments? What happens to them? Where are they going? What are we doing with them? So there needs to be a lot more education. There needs to be a lot more training. And there needs to be a lot more understanding. And I think, obviously, we're on the right track with, with talking about the issue. So it's not just in the room somewhere, but we're actually like, actively discussing it. But I feel we might need a little bit longer to really make substantial progress um, to do everything. And also seeing that the fashion industry is, is global. So it's not only across like countries, but also continents. And again, everybody has got different rules and regulations. So even if the European framework would work across all of the EU and the UK, it wouldn't necessarily mean that it then also works for the US or Australia or any of the supplier countries. So it's um it, it's massively complex. So there's just like from one to the So I kind of like got a split opinion about it. On the one hand, I think it's good because consumers are learning that creating fashion actually costs money and it comes at a price. And it's not really realistic that we pay two euros fifty, for example, for, for a t-shirt, because it costs a lot more. Um, on the other hand, if we think about society and the cost of living crisis, people who may or are reliant on fashion that is cheaper in order to actually afford and to be active members of society, they would suffer the most because they then wouldn't be able to afford it anymore. And there's this argument that they could have, that could, for example, like go and get secondhand garments. But on the other hand, I'm not sure how it's in other European countries, but for example, in the UK, secondhand shops are, are not as cheap as they used to be because it's more of a kind of like treasure hunting. It's about thrifting, um, which is great because people are making use of those garments. But again, if somebody doesn't have the financial means to actually buy something and then is excluded from society because they can't actively participate. That obviously has an issue as well. What I think is, is it like tech, so technically speaking, I think it's, it's a very great idea. And we've seen that things like this work with, for example, the ban of plastic bags, where you then either like have to pay for plastic bags and suddenly everybody brings their own bag in, even though it's just 
I don't know, like 10p, 30p, whatever it is. But that sort of like triggered something where people were saying, right, I'm actually going to save money if I'm doing this. And we need to think about something very similar, I feel, for fashion consumption, where I, I don't know like how you would actually implement it or, or what it exactly looks like. But just like to sort of like trigger and say like, right, actually, maybe I shouldn't buy all of this because I don't actually need it. But yeah, I do feel it's it's very difficult. And it's also, it's not necessarily the consumer's fault that they might, well, you you do need clothes, as we said before. Um, So it's not really the consumer's fault. So I feel there's also taking responsibility from, from an organizational viewpoint that they can't just put it onto the consumer, but they also need to take responsibility and say like, right, we actually need to change something and not just continue producing all of this, just make it more expensive. Mm -hmm. But maybe there's also another thought about, well, actually, if we make it more expensive, we actually make it more sustainable by then giving more money to our workers, producing less, doing all of those different things. But it kind of like needs to be almost like a butterfly effect. So if you do something here, you need to make sure it's translating. I think it's relevant because because of climate change and we see a lot of things happening at the moment um, with for example like droughts that can impact harvest on whether or not it's cotton or anything else uh, we see that there's a lot of pollution around and I feel we, we should care for our environment uh, so you, therefore I feel it's it's very important for for younger generations especially if you want to um, keep what we currently have we, we need to make changes in order to actually make it last uh, but I also think it's it's very fascinating for younger generations because we're at a stage where there's a lot of innovation happening with for example like new textile materials or new dyeing processes and almost like sometimes we also go a little bit backwards which is great because we're looking at well historically speaking how have we done this and suddenly people remember and then it's like gaining new skills and I feel it's also quite fun um, for younger generations and I know it's probably like an elephant in the room but during COVID I feel one of the, the good things that came out of it is that people gained new skills and some of them were crafting skills like for example like knitting, crocheting, sewing and people started making their own garments again. And that's sort of like it's reflecting on, well, actually, now I know how long it takes to knit a jumper and now I know how much it's worth. So when I then see something in a shop that is two pounds, they might say, well, actually, when I did something very similar, it took me four weeks. So this can't be two pounds. Um, so I feel like, yeah, that, that's probably also something where people are, are proud to, to also like showcase like this is what I have done and not just, oh, I bought this. Um, so hopefully that that will help or inspire younger generations as well. Mm -hmm. I think it's it's very like there's obviously a couple of trends um that have emerged with um textile innovation. So it depends on 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 what we're talking about. So if it's more uh, kind of like variable garment, like wearable um technology that might be changing quite quickly. So whether or not this is uh, different sports watches or anything that is, I don't know, like slightly lighting up for whatever reason. Um, so that might be slightly more of a trend, um, but it's interesting to kind of like see where, where technology can take us. On the other hand, if you talk about materials, I think it's more than a trend, simply because we are currently heavily relying on polyester which is a finite resource because it's made from petroleum. So we know at one point it might just not be there. So we need to understand like what can we actually do in order to produce something that's got similar qualities and properties, but is not made from a finite resource. And I think that's where the innovation starts. And that's very fascinating with, um, as you highlighted before, like there's a lot of different things that are already happening with, for example, like cactus leather, uh, we've got pineapple leather, there's fish leather, there's um, uh, viscos, um, there's a lot of, of different things that are being produced already, some of it at a very um, usable standard, and I don't mean this in a, in a kind of like degrading or negative way, but 
For example, if you talk about viscose, that is a replacement or could be a replacement for, for cotton and it's got very similar qualities. Whilst for polyester at the moment, we haven't really found an alternative yet, but there might be one there. Um, and it's also some of the um, innovations are also still relying on things like plastics because they need to have like the coatings in order to make the rainproof. Just uh, thinking about the UK weather, we've got uh, a couple of rainy days a year. <laughs> Obviously, yeah. if, if, if you do have them, then you don't want to run around completely soaking wet, but you want something that is actually covering you and protecting you. So it's just like thinking about all of those innovations, but I feel we're in a very good space and we are, we're starting to see a lot of different innovations, which is really fascinating. Mm. And when you think about textile, I think it needs to be a it needs to be a combination, and um, because there's a lot of historical knowledge that we that we have forgotten in in a very modern society, and there's only like very small communities who are still traditionally producing something. Um, so I'm just thinking of one of my colleagues who researched a community in Ghana who are doing textile weaving, and they're weaving them in very specific manners, and there's a lot of symbolism involved. There's a lot of um, color physics and color knowledge involved to actually knowing how do you create those colors how can you actually get them done and a lot of those processes were not chemical um, but they were actually like through natural dyes and that's something that's super exciting because natural dyes obviously like it's it's not necessarily a finite resource but we could use it whether or not we could scale it up is a different question but maybe we, we shouldn't scale it up and we should actually like think about right reduce production use something that is um, more natural and doesn't actually pollute. Um, whilst at the same time with modern technology and all of the different machinery that we have, I think we can do a combination of actually looking at, right, how have things been done previously? What were the impacts and how can we translate this into our modern society that we're currently having? Uh, so I feel that it needs to be a combination of both. So I would be hoping um, that they ensure that there's less of an environmental impact um, because they, they ideally should be bio-based materials. So things that could biodegrade at the end and might be used as, you know, like to, to plant something else on it, um, which is kind of like the, the, the dream. Uh, but I also would hope that it's got social implications um, because if you're looking at working conditions, if you also look at being able to provide people with skills to make sure that they are um, being able to, to practice what, what they actually like and what they really enjoy. And in terms of, I probably think it would probably have less of an economic impact in the first instance, because technology normally is quite expensive and it would mean a heavy investment but hopefully uh, at some point it would also be financially viable in order to obviously like get the innovations going to reinvest to do all of the, the, the different areas but I feel it probably has the biggest impact on the environment and then secondly like very close core it would be socially honest like I think it's um it's very much about the actual textiles themselves and what they're made out of. So I've been recently to a very large textile expo in London, and they had all of those new and innovative materials from making uh, things out of, of grass roots to they actually exhibited like some of the uh, fish leather. They had leather like materials from uh, massive leaves that you can find and it was just really mind-blowing of how much is out there and how much innovation is already happening but it's not really fully communicated I think to um to the general public so if somebody is not necessarily as invested in the topic they wouldn't really know that all of those things exist 
and some of them like do exist on the high street already like if you think about for example like the orange fiber people like don't really associate it with anything but then there were also high street brands who used it it's the same thing with the uh, pineapple fibers they have been used in in fast fashion brands for example for small collections and I feel it's it's just super fascinating to see how also perceptions are shifting from kind of like thinking I don't know like when you when you said before oh, look at sustainable fashion and then most people will probably think back to the 70s like everything is kind of like beigey browny colors not particularly you know like super um extravagant or anything else and it was more associated sometimes like with a slightly more political probably angle uh what's now if you say sustainable fashion people think more of I don't know like um Stella McCartney is probably a very good example because of um the mushroom fibers like that she used or Vivian Westwood who was very vocal um about the environment and, and everything else and then that you might also find some high street names in there as well where you say well actually they have collections that are classified as being more sustainable. Um, whether or not like they all are sustainable or not, it's, it's a completely different question. I mean, like, as I said, I don't think there's anything that's truly sustainable because we're always shifting the benchmark. But it's just very fascinating to see how those new materials are conquering the market and what you can actually do with them. And that we also can grow garments in shape so for example if you think about bacteria we can just press them and then like the the material is, is looking like a shoe or it's looking like anything else um which i thought was super fascinating mm -hmm.